Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, there's probably one in front of you there in the pew or one of the pews. And you can use that. Or you can, uh, if you have a smartphone, you can have some time to open up uh, that and um, install a Bible app. 2 Peter chapter 3. We come to our concluding sermon on our series, We Give. And guys, I've been learning a whole lot because um, I've been reading a lot and, and it's tough sometimes to write sermons because you do so much research and studying and at the end of the week you have to um, summarize everything you've learned into um, you know half an hour to 45 minutes or however long I preach for um, and and it's tough because I've been learning so much um, I even think I should start blogging I don't have the time for it but um, because blogging would allow me to to put those extra things I've been learning online for you guys to read and um, learn more with me um, and you know in the future hopefully I won't be doing that um, just for you guys to know if you're interested in, in reading these books um, um, one of them is Money God or Gift by Jamie Munson and the other one is Managing God's Money by Randy Alcorn. Um, if you want these titles, you can just ask me later. Um, and um, it's not only, they're not only about tithing, but it's also just about handling money. Um, especially uh, the book about Randy Alcorn gives a lot of awesome um, practical applications of how to um, give um, and how to instill that in your family. You know, how do we train up our children to um, live a lives um, as people who are generous, people who give, um, people who know how to handle money. Because to be honest, um, in our culture today, people do not know how to handle money. They don't know uh, how to get out of debt. They don't know um, responsibility because of their parents and then they grow up and then they don't teach their children and then they're you know messed up with that and then it keeps going on and on and on and I think um, that the world is not going to teach you um, the right things about giving and the church will uh, so these are awesome books at your disposal for you guys um, to read and if you have a Kindle or the Kindle app they're a lot cheaper it's like ten dollars for a book it's, it's just precious things that you can do we um, hope these messages have encouraged you. Um, they're not supposed to be guilt trips. Uh, we never want to guilt trip people to give. Um, it should be something that comes from the heart. And, and I hope that it has encouraged you as it has encouraged me uh, to give. And um, so after this break, after this um, series, we're going to take a break on series. We're going to have some guest speakers here. I'm going to take a little break. I'm going to preach next week. But then after that, we're going to have um, some people preach here. Uh, men of God who um, who know the Bible, who you know have awesome lives of God. One of them is my father, who's back there, and another one is a good friend of mine, Pastor Mike, as well. And they will be sharing with you things that are in their hearts. So don't miss out. Let's give them a warm welcome. Let's show them what we're all about here. Um, and then after that, we're going to start um, a new series in March um, about family, and, and this goes talks about everything from. Um, dating to marriage to the role of uh, you know a, the the father the role of a mother the role of a husband and wife um, to um, parenting to children to everything and we're gonna really teach you guys that what the Bible has to say about that because again the world is not teaching us enough and if they are they're just teaching us things that screw us up and we have a bunch of screwed up families a bunch of screwed up relationships because we're not getting enough teaching from the Word of God. Um, so we will be preaching about giving every week. Maybe um, you've only been here for like two or three weeks and you're thinking, man, every week I've been here we've been talking about giving. Uh, it's because we're in a series, okay? So this is the last uh, sermon on giving and we won't be speaking on giving for a while, probably until like next year or something, okay? Um, but today we're going to be looking at a parable of Jesus and it's funny because I was actually um, thinking of giving you guys some practical advice um, from these books and practical things about uh, parenting and those things. And, um, and so as I was writing the sermon, uh, God just completely 
changed um, what I was going to preach. And, and I think God does that sometimes, right? Like we have our own plans, we have our own uh, dreams, um, but then he ends up changing everything that we thought of and he makes it better. So hopefully uh, the sermon that God has prepared for you guys is better than the one I was preparing. Um, so uh, grab your Bible and uh, let's thank God for it and let's ask him um, to speak to our hearts today. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word because it is so edifying. Lord, it builds us up while at the same time it breaks us down. Lord, it has the power to take away our pride without humiliating us, but it also has the power to exalt us without becoming prideful. It is an amazing gift that you have given us. And Lord, we just ask that you speak to our hearts today. Lord, penetrate the hearts of the people here. Lord, those who are mature in faith, those who are infants spiritually, and those who don't know you, who never started a relationship with you, Lord. I pray that you speak to our hearts today. We pray this. In faith, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's talk about the context of what we're going to speak about today. In Matthew 24, the disciples went to Jesus and they asked Jesus, how do we know when the world is going to come to an end? Tell us because we want to know. Isn't that the question that many people want? To do? When is the world going to end? And we have those crazy weird guys who, who pick a date and then they're wrong about it. And it, oh, I, I know it now. And then they pick a date and they're wrong about it. It's like, stop trying. Okay, but, but the disciples, they ask the same question. When, how do we know this is going to happen? So Jesus begins to give them some signs in Matthew 24. If you want to read that, he gives us some signs of that. Prophecies in the Bible serves two purposes. Sometimes they forth tell. Everyone say forth tell. And sometimes they foretell. Everyone say foretell. Okay, they're, 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 they're two different things. Foretelling is a prophecy that God gave someone, a prophet, and they foretell what God is telling the people. Okay, sometimes that message was, you, you know, you need to repent from sin. You need to stop doing what you're doing. You need to go back to God. That's foretelling. But sometimes it's foretelling where it's telling things in history before it actually happens. And that's what Jesus does in Matthew 24. But where many people mess up is that they begin to guess, you know, these foretelling prophecies. They begin to try to guess exactly when it's going to happen. They begin to try to find details of like, oh, I think it's right now. You know, because the government is this way and all oh, the president Obama, hey, I think he's the Antichrist. You know, and, and we begin to try to guess when these things are going to happen. And that's not the purpose of prophecy at all. That is not the reason why they are written. So what are prophecies for? So we're going to read that in 2 Peter 3, 10 and 11, just to start out this introduction in the sermon. 2 Peter 3, 10 says, but the day of the Lord will come like a what? What is it, guys? Thief. thief, right? How does a thief come to your house? Does he announce it? Like, hey, guys, tomorrow, you know, uh, March 1st, I'm going to be at your house just so you can know, okay? So make sure the door's unlocked so I can get there and grab your TV because that plasma is nice, okay? And make sure the key is open. I'm going to steal your car, okay? No! He's saying it's going to come like a thief, meaning we're not going to expect it. And he goes on and says, And then the heavens will pass away like a war, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Um, verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, this is an awesome question, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? What's the point of what Peter is saying? 
What's his question that we should be asking ourselves every day? What sort of people ought you to be? In Matthew 25, Jesus begins to further explain. If you guys want to open there, 25, Matthew 25, he begins to further explain the future by telling parables to explain what kind of people we should be. Because Peter is saying, hey guys, we know Jesus will return. We know the world is going to be destroyed. We know the world is coming to an end. So since we know, it doesn't matter when it's going to happen, but we know it's going to happen. Since we know it's going to happen, how should we live today? How should we live today? Because how we live today will determine how we live for eternity. So in Matthew 25, the first parable talks about ten virgins. And uh, these virgins were kind of like bridesmaids to the bride. Okay, they followed her everywhere. And there were five foolish uh, virgins and five wild virgins. The, the, the five foolish virgins, they fell asleep and did not have enough oil for the lamp. And the five wise virgins did. So when the bridegroom finally came, they wanted to go to the festival. But the five foolish virgins, they didn't have enough oil for the lamp and they were stuck outside. Okay, so they're saying you need to be awake. You need to wake up because you don't know when the bridegroom is coming, so you better start living it right now. And not keep thinking, oh, I don't know when it's gonna come, I still have time, no, 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 start living it right now. So we're going to study his second parable in Matthew 25 and answer the question, what sort of person, person should you be today in light of what's to come in the future? So say to the person next to you, ask this question, what sort of pers person should you be today? What sort of person should you be today? Last week, you guys did an awesome job. I applaud you. An awesome job at feedbacking. Okay, it was really good. It was motivational for me to preach. And I want, I want that to keep going. Start increasing. All right, get out of your comfort zone. All right, learn to say amen. There you go. Learn to say amen. Learn to do the, you know, he goes, woo, that's his thing right there. That, that's his thing. Your thing may be amen. Your thing may be praise the Lord. Your thing may be preach it. You know, I, I, I want this interaction with us. I want you guys to be alive and work. Okay, so I'm not the only one excited about this message. Amen. Amen. All right, Matthew 25, verse 14 and 30. We're going to read the whole thing, and then um, we're going to piece it out one by one, okay? It says, therefore, beloved... Oh, I'm sorry. Ooh, I'm still in 2 Peter. Let me go to Matthew 25. That was a good passage, though. I should have read it. Okay, Matthew 25, 14. Well, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to them his property. To one, he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who, um, he also who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. 
But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. Now that's a lot, a lot to chew on, but we're going to piece it together so we can understand. The purpose with parables is not to pick out every detail and try to spiritualize everything. We need to look at the general um, big picture of what's going on and ask ourselves, what is Jesus trying to say with this parable? So verse 14, let's go back. It says, For it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. So this man who is going on a journey... It's Jesus, right? That's obvious there. It's Jesus. In Matthew 28, Jesus, before he goes back to heaven, he passes the baton. And what does he tell the disciples? Go and make what? Disciples, Disciples, right? He tells them, go and make disciples. That is what I did here. I came to earth. I lived 33 years here, a human life. And I gathered 12 people, 12 apostles, and I trained you guys, I I, I led you guys, I molded you guys into the men you are today. But I'm going back up there, but I'm sending you the Holy Spirit, which is me in spirit form, so you guys can continue what I have started. Because I made you guys 12 disciples Many people left and didn't want me, but now you guys are going to go and make disciples. And that transitions out into a chain effect, and now he's telling us, go and make disciples. And that's what we're doing here at Pure Word. And to accomplish this mission, Jesus gave each and every one of us gifts. He gave us skills. He gave us abilities. He gave us money. He gave us time, health, creativity. He gave us compassion, a working mind, and awesome opportunities. And he is entrusting us to all of this so that we can advance his kingdom. That is the purpose of life. And for anyone to say that there is something else I'm sorry, you're living a life that is worthless, a life that has no meaning, a life that you're gathering up goods for yourself and at the end is going to be amounted to nothing. Then verse 15. To one he gave how many talents? Hmm, right? To another two, to another one. To each according to his ability. We read this and think, well, that's not really fair. I mean, the master gave one five, another two, another one. Like, that's not really fair. We should all be having equal, you know, why do some get more and some get less? See, the thing, the answer is we are all different. And we all have different roles. And some of us have more gifts than others. And some of us have less gifts than others. But it doesn't mean that the person with more gifts is greater than the person with less gifts. It just means we have different roles. If I'm up here preaching, and that's how God gifted me to to lead or to pastor, to plant churches, but there's no one who comes here and helps with the music, or no one who comes here and helps with the computers, no one who comes here and helps with the children who are downstairs right now, we wouldn't be able to do this. Meaning, I can't do this without you guys. You can't do this without me. We need each other. That's why God, to some, he gives more talents than others. But the wrong thing is we think that I don't really have it in talents, and that's a lie straight from the pits of hell because God has given you gifts. God has given you skills. God has given you talents, and I hope that's encouraging to you guys. And we see this in verse 16 and 17. What does it say? He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with him, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. I'm just going to ask a favor if if you could turn the the middle light on. I didn't realize it was off, so you guys can read a little better. Um, So we see that these two servants began to work immediately. As soon as they got their talents which in their time is, is a lot of money. And this is just a parable. It's not like God is going to give you a lot of money. He could, but it doesn't happen to everyone. Um, 
They begin to work immediately. They don't hesitate. They keep going. But see, I think sometimes we spiritualize things when it comes to ministry way too much. What do you mean by spiritualize, Tim? Obviously, ministry is spiritual. See, this is the thing. Many times we, we think, you know, huh, should I pray today? You know, should I, you know, should I go to my campus and, and minister to these people? Should I do this? I'm going to pray on it and see what God thinks. I'm going to pray on it and see if God wants me, you know, to do something in the church and help out. Because I'm not really sure he wants me to do that. See, if we begin to think that way, then we have to pray about every decision we make in our life. So next time you're hungry, ask God, is it God's will for me to go and order a pizza? Is it God's will for me to feed my family? Of course it is! Right? No, but if we ask ourselves, and we tell the pastor, hey, pastor, you know, I got to pray on this, you know, like I got to see if that's where God wants me. God wants you to work. He gave you a gift. He gave you skills. He gave you talents. And he gave you a mind. Why? So that you can glorify God. Amen. So that you can do things in the church. So when the pastor or when a leader, when someone asks you, hey, can you help with the children? Can you do something here in the church? Don't be like, mm -hmm, pray on it. If you don't want to do it, say no. But don't make that the excuse of not helping, of not serving, of not using your gifts for something higher than yourself. Because, yeah, you can use your gifts and talents for your own work, for your career, so you can, you know, pay the bills. That's all fine and dandy. But when it comes all down to it, at the end of the day, all you've done is paid your bills. What impact had you made this week? And that's what these two servants did. They worked immediately. They saw the gifts they had. They saw the talent, the resources they had. And they said, we're going to put this to work. And what did they do? They made double the amount they had. The one who had five made five more. The one who had two made two more. They were working for God's glory. It doesn't say how they did it, but they did it. Tell the person next to you, just do it. But say it like that, like I did it. Just do it. Just do it. Okay? So he returns. He, he, he's gone for a while. He returns, and the first two servants doubled the amount they had. And he responds the same way for both of them. Verse 23. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will send you over much. Enter and get to the joy of your master. He, he responds the same way to both. And notice one had five talents, one had two. Doesn't make one greater than the other. He responded the same way to both. So it doesn't mean that you have to be up here preaching and, and with an instrument. Guys, you can be rocking babies downstairs and, and God will be like good and faithful servant. Right? Because there are babies that need to be rocked. Right? There are computers that need to be clicked. There are people that need to work in his kingdom. But a third servant, what does he do with his talent? What does he do? He what? He hides it, right? He digs it up. Why? Because he's fearful. He is fearful. He was afraid of God. But is this good fear? No, this is selfish fear. The first two servants were motivated by the hope of pleasing the master. The third servant was motivated by fear of displeasing him. It seems like it's the same thing, but the results are different. When your motivation is to please the master, you do more than you can ever imagine you could do. But when your motivation is that you're afraid of him because he's going to be displeased, you're going to do the bare minimum because you don't want to mess anything up. You don't want to take any risks. And here's the application. The third servant believed that God was too harsh. It says, God, you are a hard man. And that means harsh. He expects, oh God, you, you expect way too much from me. The master didn't sow. He was saying, you didn't sow anything, so why should I be reaping? You didn't plant these seeds, so why should I be working? There are people who think the same way about God, right? 
They say, I don't owe God anything because he has done nothing in my life. He's done nothing for me. Some even blame God because of something that happened in the past. You know, I know people that in the past, maybe, you know, there was a Christian person or their father was a Christian and loved God and all of a sudden they got into a car accident and that father died and they lost their father and, and they begin to be angry towards God because God, well, you've done nothing but take away my father, but take away something that was very important to me. Why would I work for you? Why would I live for you? See, I, I, I've, I've spoken to many atheists who had no reason for not believing in a God other than they were just angry at God. They're angry. There are many reasons why people don't live for God, but it all comes down from one deep issue. They don't know God. They only know his side of wrath and anger, but don't know his side of love and mercy. They only know his side of judgment and high expectations, but don't know his side of patience and compassion. God has given us everything. Amen. Those who walk away from him are those who don't truly know him. Not only do they ignore the fact that he is a God of judgment and wrath, but they miss out on a God who is abundantly gracious and abundantly loving. God has entrusted you guys with the responsibility in the kingdom. It's your choice whether you want to seriously invest your life wisely or squander your every breath for things that don't last. People say, why doesn't God just come down now then? Why doesn't he just finish everything off? He's giving you time. He's giving you patience. He is a patient God. There are so many people who call themselves Christians just trying to get by in this life without any real discipline, yet they call themselves disciples. They don't understand that when we don't spend time on our knees in prayer and learning about God's love in the Bible, we're spending time worshiping something else. That's called idolatry. They call themselves Christians, but all they are doing is trying to stay out of trouble just so they can get to heaven. But I'm sorry, that's not how it works, my friends. And I'm not talking about salvation by works. I'm talking about being a disciple of Jesus. Because salvation costs us nothing. But discipleship costs us everything. Jesus said in Luke 14, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And in verse 33 says, so therefore anyone, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. It's very easy to raise your hand and accept Jesus Christ. Yes, I want you, Jesus, but then to live the rest of your life not giving anything for him. Guys, God is hurt when we waste a lifetime of opportunity. It's time for the church to wake up. Amen. Look around you. Look around you. Look at the people around you. There are people sitting right beside you right now that you do not know. You may know their name, their age, and their hair color, but you don't know what's really going inside deep down in their hearts. There could be people here, statistically speaking, that could be depressed and, and considering suicide. There could be people here whose marriages are completely unraveling and completely being deteriorated by their, their, their worries. There could be people here who call themselves Christians but are completely consumed in sin and they are struggling and they do not know how to get out. But we live the Christian life thinking it's all about me. It's all about me. 
There are people that you see every day at your work, when you're walking down the street, the neighbors around your community, people that are dying inside. They are dying for hope. They are killing themselves because they think that death is the only answer. But I'm sorry, my friends, Jesus defeated death on the cross. And if we don't give them that hope, then who will? We need to give them that hope. But no, we're just too busy with our own life. As if we can actually gain life. Matthew 16, Jesus says, For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm talking about rewards. You can be a Christian and just sit in pews and just go and check it off. All right, I made it to church. Great. Now another day at, at Pure Word. And he can come and he can be saved and he can go to heaven. Yay, hooray. But guys, I, I, I don't want to just be saved. I want to enjoy the joy in the master. I want him to come and say, good and faithful servant. That's how I want to live my life. People are wasting their talents and gifts to serve themselves. Christians, guys, Christians cannot play it safe. I challenge you, read Acts. Man, read the book of Acts. And point out one Christian who played it safe. I tell you, you those who did play it safe, those were the ones who were deceiving and wicked, and some of them even died because of God's judgment. Ooh, that's harsh. But Acts, man, they lived every day like it was their last. They died for God. Stephen, the first martyr for God, man, he was just proclaiming the gospel. People didn't want, didn't want to hear it. People were covering their ears. It said they were covering their ears because what he preached seemed like it was blasphemy, but really it was the hope of Jesus Christ. And he was kneeling down on his feet while people were stoning him, stoning him. And even then he was still preaching the gospel because he believed in Jesus. He believed in the hope that made him alive, that made him live for Jesus Christ. That is the hope I'm talking about. Christians, can we play it safe? If we play it safe, we are wasting our life. Advancing the kingdom, it takes risks, guys. It's risky to love someone unconditionally. It's risky to give away your time and money. It's risky to make commitments. It's risky to stop, ask someone how they're doing, and actually wait for an honest Answer. The world says we don't have time to hear honest answers. Truth is, if we don't give that time, then even that time that we have will be taken away from us. Right? Verse 29 says, For to who for to everyone who has will be more given, and he will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The time that you have, use it for God's glory. But what abundance does Jesus promise. Now, what do we have to invest? We have our time. We have our wealth. We have opportunities. We have relationships. We have natural and spiritual gifts. We have a mind and a content of God's word. We have God's spirit, the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. We have God's church. Now, what reward is this, Tim? What reward will we get the Bible is not really clear on the reward we will get. I mean, will we get to heaven? There's like a Ferrari. They're like, doop, doop, it's yours, Tim. I'm like, ah, I'm not really going to need a Ferrari. See, I, I honestly think, see, when I, being a pastor has its ups and downs. It has its disadvantages and advantages. But the greatest advantage, far beyond money, far beyond anything else, is seeing people come to Christ. It's seeing, it's seeing Christians mature in their faith. 
It's seeing people come out from a, a thought of suicide or, or, or atheism or, or just a, you know, the corrupted mind to seeing several years down someone who, who becomes a pastor or, or you know, who becomes someone who, who loves sharing the gospel, who completely changes their way. That is the greatest reward. And if that is all I get in heaven, oh man, I'm excited for that. And see, I think the reward really is personal spiritual growth and maturity. It can be the line of souls that you brought to Christ. It can be Christians who you helped mature. It can be those people who you looked into the eye and say, how are you doing? No, 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 no. How are you really doing? Needs were compassionately ministered to. Wounds were healed. Conflicts were reconciled. Truth was lovingly told. Sammy can come up. When it comes all down to it, guys, this whole series that we've been preaching on giving and tithing and offering to the church, you really know it's not about the money. Because if you're giving money to the church but your heart isn't in it, then you're missing the point. We don't want your money. We want your heart. When Christ has captured your heart, you will give money. I don't even have to worry about that. But God has to capture your heart first, my friends. I mean, you can give out of obligation, out of guilt, and God will still use that money for his glory. But that's not what we're after. It's not how much a Christian gives that defines them. What defines a Christian is that this person is in Christ and Christ is in this person and nothing else in the world matters to them except that Christ becomes famous. We give to make Christ famous. We give to make Christ famous. We give our time, but we also give our money. Oh, how much money is valuable to us? It pays our bills, it gives us food, it gets us around, gas prices are high, the economy is bad, but yet the malls are filled every single day. And people keep giving to what? Their own selfish desires. They keep buying and giving into the world that's saying, you need more stuff. You need the car, sex, girls. You need all of those things for you to be a great person. You need to have that model body. You need to hit the gym and be so buff that you can't even wear size small anymore. You gotta go to medium. You need to be big, you need to do this, you need to do that, so you can be worth it. You know what I'm telling my friends? Jesus already showed you your value on the cross. Amen. You, you don't need anyone to say how special you are, how good you are, how worth it you are. But that's only in the eyes of Jesus because when it all comes down to it, guys, we are worth nothing. But through the eyes of Jesus, guys, look at me. You're never too young you're never too old. You're never too poor. You're never too rich. You're never too unintelligent. You're never too weird. You're never too awkward. You're never too different. And you're never too sinful to be used greatly by God. The time is now. The time is now. Enough with religiosity. Enough with just all go to church once a week and be done with it. Christianity is a lifestyle. Christianity is a person and his name is Jesus. How will you invest your life 2014? How will you invest your time? Are you too occupied with your work, that you don't have no time for your wife, your kids? Are you too occupied with what you need to do that week that you not even once 
Think about someone in the church that might be hurting. How will you invest your life, your time, your money, your efforts, your talents and gifts to his kingdom? But before I go here, I'm going to pray for those people. But before I do that, I want to give you the opportunity. If you never made a decision for Christ, if you never gave your heart to God, I want to give you the opportunity right now. Because tomorrow you may go outside and a bus may run you over and that's it. I pray that won't happen. But tomorrow's not guaranteed. And I'm sorry, but those who don't believe in a God, they're missing out big time on a loving, passionate God. If your heart is stirring right now and you can't explain what it is, that's God pursuing you. That's God saying, I want you but I don't want just your time, I want everything. I want your dreams, I want your visions, I want your aspirations. Because the version of the person you thought you'd be sucks. The version of the person I've created you to be is beyond your imagination. You can do things that you never knew you could, not because of your own gifts, but because I'm in you. Twelve men that Jesus trained started the church and they changed the course of history. And even today, we're still planting churches here in Bethlehem, Pure Word Church where we have thousands of people out there who do not know the gospel and they need to be here where you're sitting. But but for those who are here, I'm going to count to three. And if you've never made a decision to accept Jesus as your Savior, to say, God, I want this relationship with you, when I say three, just raise your hand and we're gonna pray with you. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he cares for you. Three, does anybody want that today? Does anybody? Doesn't matter what people think around you, don't. It's between you and God. Does anybody want to accept Jesus? in their heart. Anyone? Amen. Anyone else? Amen. (laughs) Oh, man. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it has the power to save anyone who believes. Anyone else want to join those two? John, yeah! Oh man, I've been praying for that guy for a while. (laughs) Anyone else? I want to ask you guys to come up here. You can put the camera down, John, come up here. Come on, don't be shy. I'm going to ask Robin to come. This is Robin's twin brother, by the way. <laughs> what you guys are going to say, the prayer is, is not, it doesn't mean anything, but only if your heart is in it. So I want you guys to say it like, like you mean it and say it out with your lips and with your heart and with your mind and say these words after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. I know that I have sinned, but I want forgiveness. 
come into my life and save me. Wipe my slate clean and change me. Help me to live a new life in you and so that I can work for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. And I pray in your name. I pray in your name. Amen. 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 I was just telling Kevin there about the vision of the church and how we want to reach 2,000 people. Your first reaction may be, Tim, that's impossible. But you just saw three people right here in one day give their life to God. When the church first started, Peter preached a sermon and it saved 3,000 people that day. Why? Because they heard hope. Because the gospel has power. Nothing in me, nothing that I did was able to save them. But the gospel right here has power. Who agrees with me? Who loves the Bible?